Shalom Chavim, I'm Stephen Benun. you're watching Israeli News Live. Today we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Petrovich, uh, who is an author of an incredible book here. Uh, we're going to be sharing with you guys here the book here, The Words, World's Oldest Alphabet. Uh, and Dr. Petrovich, he has authored this book, working on a second book as well right now. And he has joined us here in the studio, or not in the studio, but via Skype here. Uh, here on Israeli News Live here in the Czech Republic here. So, Dr. Petrovich, thank you for joining us today. And what a pleasure. I got, I got a chance to speak with him for a couple hours last night and really get to pick his brain on things. Uh, but the discovery, in my opinion, is probably the most profound uh, in, in this decade, in that, for that matter. Dr. Petrovich, welcome. And uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about you know, how you got started on this? How did you come about the discovery uh, that the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew alphabet is actually derived from um, the, um, the, the, the Egyptian hieroglyphics? Sure, it's great to be with you and with all of your uh, viewers. Um, I'd start by saying, first of all, I'm definitely not the first one who has connected the world's oldest script with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. In fact, over a hundred years ago, a British um, Egyptologist named Sir Alan Gardner wrote a very important work that even much of it stands until today, and uh, he, w he suggested very uh, resoundingly that uh, that hieroglyphics are the basis of um, of the world's oldest alphabet, which has always been, by the way, uh, for 150 years of scholarship. Uh, been understood to be a Semitic language, so it's always been just a question of what is that Semitic language. And I'm actually also not the first to suggest that Hebrew is that correct Semitic language. That's the basis for um, this oldest alphabet. In 1923, there's a German scholar named Hubert Grimme who proposed this very um, thesis. And unfortunately, at his time, not enough was known about all of the individual letters of the alphabet. So he wasn't able to precisely identify all of the letters correctly. And if you're missing or you have wrong a few of the letters, that obviously you can understand is going to cause big problems for um, correctly uh, deciphering uh, the inscriptions, whatever Semitic language it is. And the other mistake that um, that Grima made was he didn't always accurately draw the inscriptions. And he didn't, at the same time, to his credit, didn't have the technology that we have today where we can do what I did, which is to take uh, all of the important photographs of each of the inscriptions that I've translated, and I have um, projected them onto PowerPoint, and I'm able to study them at up to 400% magnification. That, and that allows me also to make a very precise um, computer-aided drawing that can be manipulated after you first uh, tr try to draw it. So you can keep correcting it until you have it exactly right. So that has um, uh, been part of what um, exists in the history behind this. But as far as how I um, was able to make these connections. Really, it was by accident. Before, that's how before you, in. before you actually go to that, one thing that you mentioned just now that I think is interesting is the fact that you don't actually have to be in Egypt uh, per se to be able to study the work that you're doing. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. when I wrote the book Yom Suf, that was one of the things that I had uh, stumbled across as well. Uh, I was looking at, um, and even though he's not a, he, he's, he's an amateur archaeologist, you might say, but uh, that of Ron Wyatt, looking at his uh, work as far as the Exodus crossing, 
and using Google Maps, I just begin to scan the mountains all in that whole region uh, around his uh, suggested place for the actual Red Sea crossing. And of course, I had met and interviewed Vivica Pontian, who was in the uh, Exodus Revealed documentary, and uh, she had really brought in some very enlightening things as well. But just from Google Earth and being able to zoom down in on those locations, I found one very interesting artifact, and that was that the mountain exactly due east and in line with the sandbar that runs across it in the Nueva Beach was a burnt mountain. And yet, all these guys that had worked on that uh, from, you know, finding what they considered to be the real Mount Sinai inside of uh, Saudi Arabia, none of those had ever solved that particular burnt mountain. And not saying that it has been uh, proven by archaeologists or anything at this point, but the, the, the point that I like in your work, though, is that, like you said, you can take with a 400 magnification and, you know, look at an artifact and really begin to see the fine details in that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we're getting to the most exciting part, though, of, of, of this conversation at an early point. But we're going to talk a lot of things here tonight. But uh, I, I'm excited about the next part I know you're going into. Sure. Yeah, this is, this is part of the fun part. Um, okay, so um, as for how I was able to make these connections, it's, it's really kind of by accident. I was just studying... Uh, Syro-Palestinian archaeology and kind of stumbled into evidence for the Israelite uh, occupation in Egypt before the Exodus, which translates to 1876 to 1446 BC. And that led me on a long archaeological trail in which I was able to identify just an amazing amount of evidence that really exists that's never really been uh, documented or um, provided by scholars up, up until now, and probably part of that is because very few scholars are really careful in their study of the field of Egyptology and the field of uh, biblical studies, and then the, the archaeology of um, the Levant, which is Syro Palestine, Canaan, Israel. So, uh, in my case, I was able to not only find material cultural evidence such as ceramics and uh, uh, tools and weapons and um, architecture, but also inscriptional evidence with which I was able to identify several very important biblical figures, which include in Middle Egyptian inscriptions, by the way, which includes Joseph, his two oldest sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh being the older, and then one of Manasseh's obscure sons named Shechem. So really it was with all of that that I continued to follow this trail and it led me into what I like, what I like to call one gold mine after another. And, of course, some of those gold mines were the identification of these important biblical figures. Now, with one of those figures, Manasseh, he actually was part of an expedition from the eastern Nile Delta down into Sinai, southwestern Sinai, a site called Serebit el Khadim in Arabic. And that site is where they would go, the Egyptians would, would make expeditions, and then they would go down there, they'd take a band of people, all of the right uh, uh, people as far as administrators and scribes and um, cooks and uh, um, people of, uh, who were expert in travel and, you know, miners and you name it. But they would have these large groups that would go down and they would spend a season down there excavating turquoise from the mines at Serebit. And Chebeded, who is an uh, Asiatic that I'm re referring to as, uh, as Manasseh, he, during his journeys over a period of some years, and again, this is a, a seasonal trip once a year, he would be the one to inscribe a number of these stele. A stela, uh, and that's singular of stele, a stela is basically an eight to nine foot high stone slab that's been uh, flattened on two sides and then it's used to inscribe. And it basically looks like a, an oversized tombstone. And now, so, now, do they, Dr. Petrovich, do they keep those, uh, when, when they inscribe these stones, these stelas, do they keep those at the location where they actually inscribe them at, or are they taking these stones after they've inscribing them and going back to Egypt with it? Yes, Stephen, they do keep those stelae there. They are erected permanently 
at that site in Sinai. And that's one of the reasons they've been able to survive for millennia. First of all, they're in a, an arid, dry climate, which is, as much as can be, it's climate friendly. And, um, and then of course, these are extremely heavy in weight, and so they're, they're, they're uh, put in the ground, much like you would put a telephone pole into the ground so that it stays permanently in an erect position, and that's, that's what would happen. And so, Chemedet, uh, he would be the one to inscribe these stele during the years of his um, travels down to uh, extract turquoise. And invariably, regularly, as a routine, at the base of the stele, and of course, each stele basically describes that year's campaign and some of the people who were on it, some of the important events and outcomes, right? Well, um, what Chemedet would do is at the base of the stele, he would draw um, in a rectangular position, he would draw a picture of himself on a donkey, and then an Egyptian attendant on the reader's left, and a young boy on the reader's right. And by the way, the boy would increase in his height uh, as you would go along year to year in these uh, stele that he would inscribe. So, in the course of studying one of those, I came across, uh, and, and oh, I should mention that uh, he continually had um, an inscription above each of those um, drawings of him on the donkey and the, and the two, two young people. And um, they would change all the time what he would inscribe there. Sometimes he would name himself, sometimes he would name uh, the, the two people to his left and right. Um, and one time, in one of the last journeys that he probably made to Serebi, he actually inscribed a caption that was not routine. It wasn't completely 100% Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics, which is very out of the ordinary. And I noticed this right away. Well, in this caption, there are two, and we'll call them pictographs. It's basically like a letter or a hieroglyph. You know, if it's drawn, it's a pictograph. And so two pictographs were not typical hieroglyphs. And, you know, I've studied Egyptian formally for three years. I knew right away these are not hieroglyphic. Uh, um, signs. Is that actually so, on that? Is that on the stone here that that you sent to me as well, Dr. Petrovich? Is that the stone that you're talking about that you saw? Not that. that. This one there here. Is. Okay. That one. So this is the one I'm referring to now. So it's good to have that even up now. Yes. So in two of the words on this inscription, and by by the way, this is known as Sinai 115, which dates to year 818 of Amenemhat the third a ruler of the 12th dynasty. Um, so in the first word, it looks like an hourglass, and that is not a hieroglyph. That's a Canaanite syllabic. And a syllabic basically is connected to our word syllable, and for a syllable you would have a consonant and a vowel. And together, that's that's a phonetic, it's pronounced, that uh, what, what's underlying that drawing there, and it's an ingot actually, and it, it makes the sound weak. And so I noticed right away that's not a hieroglyph. And secondly, I noticed that in the word um, on, on the far left to the, to the reader's left, um, in that word, there is a square that actually is a little bit, um, it, it's more of a rectangle and, and longer vertically than horizontally. Looks, like, right looks like a mem safit, as we would say in Hebrew, okay. for the final mem okay. is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Right, it looks like a final mem, exactly, exactly, and, and um, yeah, so, um, and, and I realized that that letter also was not a, a hieroglyph, and I can confirm this um, by the way that Kevedet would draw certain um, hieroglyphs in all of his uh, inscriptions that are there at Serebit. So, that caused me you know, that raised some flags with me as well, and plus I knew already at that point that, um, that Hebedet is a, an important biblical figure, um, Manasseh. And so realizing that, that this was a very different kind of inscription, and knowing that only the first two letters were translated by the scholar who published all of these Sinai inscriptions, who is Alan Gardner, the one I mentioned before, um, I had to then work with that inscription until I could understand it exactly for what it says. And, and it has an amazing um, translation. Gardner correctly translated the first two words as six 
Asiatics or six Levantines, six people who live who uh, who derive from the Levant. And then he stopped translating there. And what follows is an amazing um, uh, uh, set of words, which is, and it starts in apposition, so it's in agreement with these uh, Levantine people. It's it's renaming, restating who they are, but in different terms. And so it says, Hebrews of Beit El, Beth El, House of God, the Beloved. And this, of course, refers to the historic um, homeland, the home city, the hometown of Jacob and his family before they left Canaan. And if you study yes. the biblical text carefully, you know that it says uh, that, that Jacob was instructed to go to Beit El, to Beth El, and to reside there. And he ridded his home of idols, he took his family, and that was their homestead until the very point where they moved to Egypt. And of course, certainly they were semi-nomadic people, so they weren't always at home per se at Bethel, but that was their homestead. That was their hometown. Just like for me, Akron, Ohio will always be my hometown. That's where I'm from. So that's what they were describing. And then he writes the word beloved after it to describe it. To say any other city, but that it was Bethel, the beloved, because of that connection that it has historically to the family of Jacob. That so is amazing. right away, of course, uh, I was amazed that here we have an inscription that names Hebrew people in 1842 B.C., which until now, the oldest inscription that names Israelites dates back to 1219 B.C. in the Merneptah stele. And then uh, in 2010, a very important article that uh, was published that um, identifies um, Israelites also on a, um, a pedestal, it's called the Berlin Pedestal, published by Peter Vandeveen and several others. And that dates back paleographically to the reign of Amenhotep II from the 18th dynasty, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. But um, that mentions Israelites as well in the context of a conquest list. So that dates, I date that to 1446. So now we're talking, you know, almost 400 years earlier, we have an inscription that mentions Hebrew, Hebrew people. And this fits very tightly with biblical chronology and the proper synchronization with Egyptian history, which we'll also talk about soon. So this is really season what launched me into all of these discoveries well this is you know it's amazing you know for one because you know like like you you know as, as you well know many of your um, Egyptologists today think that Israel was only uh, the ones that are willing to admit that there was a, uh, a a Semitic presence there the Israelite presence in the Middle East there they try to say it's only for about 200 years and so therefore when we try to look at the biblical account they're wiping out 200 years of the history of the Israelites actually being there in in the uh, in, in Egypt or in Goshen or whatever the case may be at that time. Um, Dr. Petrovich, you you're, you claim that there are three biblical figures that are named uh, in the 16 inscriptions that you have translated. Can you tell us what they are and what is the importance of this? Absolutely, Stephen. And let me start by saying. I never in my wild, wildest imagination would have expected, when, when I finally became confident that I had identified every, uh, or I should say solved every disputed letter correctly and understood the original 22 letter alphabet correctly, I never thought, projecting ahead to when I would be deciphering all of these inscriptions, that I would bump into three biblical figures. And it just so happens that I did in three different inscriptions. They're all inscriptions that date to the middle of the 15th century or so BC. And um, and two of them name individuals who, there's only one character in the Bible who goes by that name. Actually, I should say this, all three characters are only representing one biblical figure. Um, so the first inscription actually dates as early as the 13th dynasty, and that's basically in the beginning of the 1700s BC. And I have it dated to 1772, and that inscription mentions the name of Asnath. Asnath, of course, is the wife of Jacob, I'm sorry, the wife of Joseph. 
Um, and she was, of course, an Egyptian. She was a priestess. And um, she's from the city of On, which is Heliopolis in ancient Egypt. And Asnaf is mentioned in this, in this inscription, um, I think posthumously, which means that it mentions her after she was already dead. Because based on the dating of the inscription and the date that she would have been um, bearing her children, uh, which was the 18, probably the 1880s uh, BC, um, she, she would have been 130, maybe 140 years old at this time if she were alive. So probably she had already been deceased. And it makes sense because it matches with the inscription. It doesn't speak of her as being an alive individual, but it speaks of a house that's named in reference to her. And the inscription reads like this. It says, um, oh, and it, by the way, this is Sinai 376, which you have a, a photo of, and um, you can see my drawing as well. And it says this, the house of the vineyard of Asna and its innermost room were engraved. They have come to life. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about this inscription is that there are three uh, words that are found in 1 Kings 8 in the narrative about the construction of the temple under Solomon, the first temple. And those three terms are the word uh, bait, the uh, construct form of the word bait, or house. Second is um, the word debir, which is an innermost room, and it's used in the Bible and of temples in general, uh, of the Holy of um, Holies. The Holy of Holies, exactly, the, the sanctuary, the most sacred uh, room uh, that's in the temple. And then there's a verb uh, for the word engrave, kala. And kala uh, means, means to engrave something, and it was used of the beautification of the temple that took place um, to make uh, you know, particular um, engravings uh, within, especially on the car of the wood. But in the case of um, this inscription, it, it just says that um, this, this is the house, the vineyard of Asana, and its innermost room, they have been engraved. Um, so some part of the outside of the house or the inside of the house was engraved, and certainly the innermost room, the inside of that room, would have been engraved as well. So um, you have the same imagery uh, and you have the same architecture between the temple and then in this case the much earlier house that probably was, it, it represents, um, um, well, it, it's sitting in a vineyard, so it's the house of the vineyard of Asna. So the, the vineyard is named after Asna, and that connection makes sense if Ephraim and Manasseh have moved to the site where Jacob and his sons had settled. Um, but it mentions um, um, the house of the vineyard, and probably this is something similar to, and I go back to my 10 years in Russia. Um, while I lived in Russia, I came to know many of my friends had summer dachas, and a dacha is basically where yes. you would go and prepare your summer garden. Um, and you'd live there, you'd be on the site, you'd protect it. Every morning you'd come out and you'd uh, prune and you'd take care of them. And, um, and it became very convenient for you to stay right at the site of where your garden was. And this is probably something similar with, with the vineyard. When it was time for the growing season, someone probably lived right in that house. And there were um, several rooms. And it was probably uh, constructed in the architectural design uh, that goes back to Levantine architectural style, which is the tripartite house or the tripartite um, um, building. So you have a lot of continuity here between Levantine uh, culture, Levantine lifestyle, and, and the biblical text as well, all within this one inscription, Sinai 376. Then we have another inscription, uh, Sinai 375a, um, which is actually called a plaque. It's inscribed on both sides. Sinai 375c is on the reverse. Uh, but it's a very short inscription. Um, what's, what's most important, uh, especially for our purposes right now, is Sinai 375a provides a reference to a biblical character that lived actually in the lifetime of Moses. And his name is Ahisamach. 
You know, before, before we actually go into that, just so the viewers, as you guys are looking at this, what's fascinating with Dr. Petrovich's work here, as you can see, and, and some of you guys that are familiar with some of the ancient, uh, the, the oldest Hebrew forms, like the ox head with the aleph right here, identified here, and this is what Dr. Petrovich is talking about. You have so many of these uh, characteristics here that are obviously the Hebrew alphabet, and, uh, and, and it's just fascinating. I, I didn't mean to interrupt Dr. Petrovich, no, no. but just so that they can kind of connect the dots there as they're looking at this, and of course the book will do it even, even more so, but uh, you can see the modern Hebrew letters in green that Dr. Petrovich has put beside that of what it is in, in, in the, the, uh, the ancient uh, Hebrew scripts there, but the ox... The ox head is probably the most obvious one there. We can see in both the cases of the aleph that, have, that has been inscribed on the, the stone. The ayin for the eye, which in Hebrew ayin means eye as well. Uh, you know, just things that I can see myself just right off looking at it. Uh, not really looked at that before, but I understand some, a little bit of that anyway. So I think it's yeah, fascinating. And, and since you mentioned that, I'll just keep going. So to the right of that uh, upper more of the two ox heads, just to its right, is a courtyard, and that courtyard represents the biblical Hebrew word chatzer. Uh, to the right of that are two um, slanted lines that are parallel. That actually is a vowel when they're together in, um, in um, Middle Egyptian, and that makes the long I sound, e. And of course, Hebrew from its very beginning didn't represent vowels. So the very inclusion of a standard hieroglyph here, uh, these are, it's called the dual signs. Uh, dual is something that's paired. And, he, and even, of course, Hebrew has paired words like yes. night, water is, is a paired word. Yes. Uh, and shemayim is a paired word. So um, there you have the first part of his name on the, on the first line there, ah-i, and then it starts right below on the second horizontal line with the fish. The fish isn't representing the word fish in Hebrew. It's amazingly representing the word stink, sarach, in Hebrew. Now, why would you do that? Well, where did the Israelites live at the time? They lived on the banks of the Nile River. What makes a stinky smell along the Nile River in ancient times or modern times? Dead fish. fish. <laughs> so, the Egyptians used the word, used a hieroglyph of a fish with their word for stink, the Egyptian word for stink. And sure enough, the Hebrew word for stink starts with what we know today as uh, 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 Samek. Oh, Samek, yeah. Yes. Samek, right. And then the next letter after that to the right is a wave of water, and that, of course, represents the Hebrew word ma'im, because ma'im is water in Hebrew. And then to the right of that is a hand to represent uh, the palm of the letter calf. So you have a very simple uh, inscription there mentioning this name, Ahi Samat, written in two horizontal lines. And it's one word, and there's only one biblical figure who's named Ahi Samat. You can find him in Exodus 34 and a couple other places. And Ahisamach is the, is the father of Aholiab, one of the two men that the Bible says God appointed to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle, of course, is like a moving temple before there was a temple. It said that God dwelled there within um, the tabernacle, and therefore it was a holy place. Well, it had to be constructed, and Aholiab is the man who was uh, one of the two who, who got the job. And that meant he was in charge of carpentry, he was in charge of masonry and stonework, he was in charge of the lens, the metallurgy, all of those uh, crafts. He had to specialize in them, and, um, and he had to, um, uh, to know them well to be able to construct this, this tabernacle. And sure enough, what the inscription, Sinai 75a, says is, the overseer of, of minerals. Ahisamach, as uh, the the vertical, uh, I'm sorry, as the horizontal, the translation of the horizontal lines. Now, 
The overseer, of course, means that he had a position of authority. So he was probably an older man. Um, as well, minerals, which it's, it's an abbreviation there, and I'm only suggesting that minerals is the best way of referring. It's like if you had a, a person who had a title, job title, and it was D and then dot. Even instead right. of DR, dot, just D dot. Who would that person be? And that's what you have here. So you have to, uh, you have to suppose. You, you can't be certain. But the most logical option out of the few um, plausible options is minerals because they were there to extract turquoise minerals from the mines. So he probably was the overseer who, who was involved in the, the process of, uh, you know, what happens after you ex the miner extracts the turquoise and they bring it to someone, who's that person? Well, that has to be an expert craftsman who understands minerals as it may be um, an ancient geologist per se would. And so Ahi Sanak probably was some type of expert in metallurgy, or in possibly metallurgy, but certainly in minerals. And so he would be the one to um, to know how, you know, to, to know what to do with the minerals, you know, once they had been drawn out from uh, the turquoise mines. So that's who Ahi Sanak was, and he's mentioned in this uh, inscription that dates probably between 1500 and 1446 BC. And, and it fits perfectly with biblical history because Aholiab would have served as this uh, constructor, if you will, of the tabernacle after 1446. So uh, before the Exodus, um, Ahisamach, his father, would have been the one in charge of the minerals at uh, Sergei El Khadi. Exactly. Makes, makes sense, you know, because like you said, you got to have the biblical time frame has definitely got to work. And there is, uh, we've actually covered that, so our next one that we're going to move on to now, uh, you have one more stone uh, that we're going to look at, and that is the one about Moshe. So there's a third biblical figure that also showed up in these inscriptions, and I certainly never expected to see him at, uh, in an inscription at all because uh, of the short time that would have been uh, allowable for these events uh, to have taken place. But um, in Sinai 361, which actually um, we have a, a picture both of the, uh, or a photo of the inscription, and then a uh, representation of my drawing of it as well. And in Sinai 361, which reads top to bottom in, in columns from right to left, um, this inscription uh, actually names Moses in the Hebrew name Moshe. Uh, which is the final two letters on the first vertical line on the fragment that's joined together to the main part of the, the stone um, featuring the inscription. And what it says is, how it reads is, our bound servitude had lingered. Moses then provoked astonishment. It is a year of astonishment because of the lady. And the lady refers to a foreign deity also known as Ba'alat, the she Ba'al. So she is the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the consort of the storm god from the Levant, who is considered the chief of the gods. And uh, um, she was um, connected to the worship that went on at the site of Serbi Echadim. In fact, um, she had a temple there under her Egyptian name because the Egyptians connected her with Hathor. So there was a temple of Hathor. Um, at the site um, where a lot of these inscriptions were found. And the inscription is extremely important because it mentions activities that went on um, for the Israelites, for the Hebrew writing people. And, and according to this person who wrote, he said, our servitude had lingered. Um, but this um, servitude, this this uh, slavery, if you will, uh, was going on, and then in the midst of that, an event happened, and that event was Moses coming in and provoking astonishment. It doesn't say what astonishment he provoked. If you believe that this is the Moses of the Bible, and the chronology, by the way, is perfect uh, with biblical history for this being the Moses who led the Israelites out of Egypt, if this is the correct Moshe, and the Bible knows of no other Moshe, of course, in its long history of the Hebrew Bible. Um, 
This could be the moment when Moses had returned from Midian to Egypt, and of course very astonishing events took place as he stood before Pharaoh, and a lot of these um, amazing events took place. And if that's true, then the writer of this inscription is claiming this to be um, the year that Moses provoked astonishment. And you know, it says that this um, says this was a year of astonishment. So it it fits the biblical history uh, perfectly as well because when Moses returned from Midian, it was less than a year that he was there before the Exodus uh, took place. So the astonishing events um, were, according to this inscription, not going on for very long. It was in a year, and that matches the the period in the biblical text where it would have been a year as well. Well, you know, Dr. Petrovich, one thing that's just amazing uh, when we're looking at this as well, and that is the fact that uh, there's so many archaeologists and Egyptologists that, that have argued and tried to completely do away with the idea that there was an Israelite presence in Egypt, uh, but, let, you know, with, with the more and more evidence that is coming out, um, you know, even, even um, th that we are starting to see that there is clear evidence that, in fact, yes, there has been an Israelite presence, but now with the work that you're doing yourself, this is what's really uh, setting a complete new precedent uh, in, in archaeology or, you know, let alone the Egyptology as far as trying to come up with a, with a correct chronology. Uh, we know David Roll has tried to work on a new chronology uh, himself, but your work kind of takes it even into a little bit of a different direction, which maybe is not too far off in time frame wise. But what I find interesting is that with seeing the connection of the Hebraic alphabet being derived from uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, how many, how many artifacts are there that really should probably have, have a second look at to begin with that, that may be whether they're in the museums or whatever the case may be, uh, just droves of them that might give us a much better view of what happened during the Israelite uh, time in Egypt, especially with the fact that you're seeing a, a stone that's being written that's writing about Moshe and that he's actually, you know, Moses for, for those that don't speak Hebrew, but, uh, you know, that, that, that it was the year of those great things that, that, that were done, uh, those great events there, but also the fact that they were in bondage. And that's another issue, Dr. Petrovich, that so many today, especially amongst uh, Arabic scholars, and, and, I, and I don't knock the Arabic scholars because many, uh, many Arabs, uh, even in the Muslim world, they also believe in the same Exodus story that the, uh, the Jews and the Christians believe in. Uh, you know, the only difference for them is it's just a little different outcome when they get to uh, the promised land, so to speak. But they all believe that Moses was a prophet. They all believe that he led the children of Israel out of the wilderness journey. It's in the Quran as well as in the, both the Christian and the Jewish Bibles as well. So then why is there such a big to-do that they say that the Jews never were there? And so I, I see this as a fascinating discovery and from the very beginning. Absolutely. So what about any more characters that we have that you have discovered thus far on these stones? Um, those three are the, the extent of the biblical figures that I've been able to, uh, again, stumble into in the uh, work of translating um, all of these inscriptions. But of course, it's important to note there are more inscriptions, more especially Sinaitic inscriptions, from the middle of the 15th century BC, the lifetime of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II, according to the pottery that was found in the mines themselves, uh, which of course becomes one of the most important um, artifacts for dating anything of the ancient world is, is pottery. And that pottery reflects the time period of those two kings when Egypt was at its height um, as far as um, its, uh, its political footprint in the ancient world. It was one of the two superpowers during that time. So, um, but there are other Sinaitic inscriptions from the very place of, that most of these inscriptions from the middle of the 15th century were found that have not been translated by anyone, and, and including by me. And the reason for that in most cases is because most of them are fragmentary or not all of the letters are discernible, or 
uh, the beginning of the inscription is missing, and it becomes very difficult to accurately translate the entire inscription, inscription if you don't know what it says from the beginning, because you could easily start a new word that actually, with the letter you're beginning with, is the second or the third or the fourth letter of a word that went before it that you can't see. So all of that can become... So there are other inscriptions out there, though, that could be translated, or at least parts of them, um, and maybe that's future work for me or someone else. We're looking forward for the future work. Uh, got two more questions, Dr. Petrovich, uh, before closing uh, in our broadcast for today. But uh, one, with the work that you have done, I know a lot of viewers would be very curious to know, not in every single case, but starting back with Joseph and maybe even in the time of Moses, with the work that you have actually conducted, who do you believe was the Pharaoh of the time of Joseph when he came? Because this Pharaoh was no doubt what we would consider today as a good man. He was an honorable mm -hmm. Pharaoh. Uh, and I've always believed that, you know, how could God not look favorably upon him with the kindness that he showed to Joseph and to his family as well until, of course, the Pharaoh that rises up that does not know Joseph. What do you believe are the identities of these two Pharaohs? Okay, first of all, I would say, Stephen, that um, before coming to this question, we have to set up a foundation, and that is a foundation of chronology. And with that, I can say that I, um, I have worked exhaustively on this subject, even going back to the turn of the century when I really solved many of the chronological issues to my own satisfaction. And of course, uh, my career began in biblical exegesis and working with the Hebrew um, uh, texts of the uh, of the of the Hebrew Bible th themselves, and also with the uh, textual uh, variants in uh, manuscripts, and that can become important because in the most important chronological texts in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible that um, that deal with issues of chronology. Uh, you have variance in how the manuscripts read, and you have to uh, know exactly what, you know, with confidence, what would have been the correct reading before you can proceed. But once those are solved, it becomes clear that once then you you synchronize, which means to bring together in in time with the, the time element, you synchronize is Israelite history, ancient Israelite slash Judite history with the history of the other peoples of the Near East. And of course, this can be done very uh, effectively in the first millennium BC with the synchronisms between the Israelites and the Neo-Assyrians. And with those synchronizations, we can confidently, uh, through the connections, come out with a number of 967 as the, as the correct year for when Solomon, Solomon began work on the first temple. And that, of course, takes you to 1 Kings 6.1, one of the most important uh, chronological texts in the entire Hebrew Bible, which says that the work on the temple that Solomon conducted began in the 480th year after the Israelites uh, had come out of Egypt, that exodus that it, that it speaks about in the book of Exodus. And so... Um, if then you take the 480th year, which means, of course, 479 and change, and you go back in time from 976, it gives you 1446 BC, and that becomes the correct year for the Exodus. And this can be actually confirmed by a number of extra biblical sources, such as the Jubilee cycle. And if you look at the work of Roger Young and the articles that he's published, that will effectively, I think, um, convince any um, objective person that 1446 fits not only with biblical chronology, but with all of the other um, sources of uh, extra biblical sources that, that attest as well to this year. So then you go to from there to Exodus 12, 40 and 41, which gives you a very clear indication going back into time chronologically from the time of the Exodus to the time when Jacob and his family first settled in Egypt. And it says very clearly that this happened 430, that the Exodus happened 430 years to the very day after the Israelites um, came into Egypt under Jacob. So then we go back from 1446 BC of the year of the Exodus 
430 years, and it gives us 1876 BC. And that becomes a very hard and fast fixed number in Egyptian chronology. Then, of course, you have to jump in and do work with Egyptian chronology, which, of course, is a variable. Can you come up with a chronological scheme that would match this time period in Egyptian history that, um, uh, that you can be confident about? So there would have to be means by which the Egyptians recorded their, their history, their, and in this case, their chronology, that can be put on what we call the absolute timeline, the timeline we know of as AD and BC. So it just so happens that the two periods in the second millennium where you can be confident about Egyptian chronology are Dynasty 18, the lifetime of Moses, and then going back to Dynasty 12, the uh, lifetime of Joseph and his sons. And with that, years ago, and this is, again, going back uh, 15 to 17 years, I was able to come up with a synchronization that I could see fit perfectly between Egyptian chronology and and biblical chronology. And with that, um, I was able to come up with some important uh, dates for events that happened. Because once you have as an anchor the year when Jacob moved to Egypt, you can then um, fill in the blanks with some of the events, the dated events that are in that same uh, generation. And with that being the case, 1885 becomes the year that Joseph interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. So Joseph would have stepped in as the second in command in Egypt. And by the way, I can identify him as one of the viziers. And the funny part is I wasn't able to do this until about 2008 or so. For all the years before that, I would never call Joseph a vizier because I wanted to know for sure that there was a title of vizier that goes with Joseph, and there is. And this I'm going to demonstrate in my second book, which I'm currently writing. So 1885 was the year he interpreted the dream and became the vizier, the second in command. This happened in the same year as the uh, transition from the death of Amenemhat II and the coming to the throne of his son. Um, or I'm sorry, they, they had a co-regency, but but his his son came on as a co-regent, and that's Sesostris II in 1885 BC, according to this uh, chronological scheme. So. That means probably it would have been the younger pharaoh, the new pharaoh, who was on the throne when Joseph interpreted his dream. And if you look at the erratic behavior, it more reflects a younger son instead of a hopefully wiser father. And that then means that Sesostris II is the pharaoh at the beginning of the seven years of, of, uh, of abundance. And so Sesostris II becomes the abundance pharaoh. And ironically, and, and I didn't plan it this way, but... Um, what would be the year of the death of Sosterus II happens to be the same year in which we have a transition from the seven years of abundance to the seven years of famine. And the pharaoh who came onto the throne then was his son, Sosterus II's son, Sosterus III. And so he is the famine pharaoh, according to a synchronization between Israelite and, and um, Egyptian chronology, according to, to the scheme that I think is, is very... Um, dependable. So um, in 1878, is, you have the year of that transition uh, from from abundance to seven years of abundance to, to seven years of famine, and also um, Sesostris III comes on to the throne. And then um, 1859 would have been the year that uh, Sesostris III brought his son, Amenemhat III, onto the throne. And it's the same year in which Oddly enough, Jacob dies, and he, of course, um, gives the greater blessing to Ephraim rather than Manasseh, and all of this is part of it, more of what we'll go into in my second book. So those are some of the events that, that tie in and give us a, a chronological framework to work with. And then moving forward 430 years um, to the time of the Exodus, um, the only figure, the only pharaoh, Egyptian king, who works um, to fulfill all of the requirements, the biographical requirements of the Exodus Pharaoh. There's one Pharaoh who fulfills all of those requirements, and that is, so, and that is, I'm sorry, uh, Amenhotep II. So if you were to ask questions such as, uh, well, you want to you want to identify who is the Exodus Pharaoh, and you start asking questions about, could this Pharaoh have lived through the tenth plague because he was not his father's eldest son? 
Could this Pharaoh's son have died during the 10th plague? Which one? During the Exodus Pharaoh's son. Can any of this Pharaoh's military campaigns be related to the Exodus events? Is there any evidence to confirm that this Pharaoh interacted with the Hebrews after they left Egypt? And of course, one final historical question is, does this, uh, does this Pharaoh have a father who lived longer, who ruled longer than 40 years? Whoever it is, whoever the Exodus Pharaoh is, if he's a historical figure, if you're going to take the biblical text for what it is, you have to suppose that his father must have reigned over 40 years. The only pharaoh in the 18th or 19th Egyptian dynasties who fits this biographical sketch, who fits all the requirements of the Exodus Pharaoh, is Amenhotep II. Nobody else even comes close and, to meeting all of those biographical requirements. And 40 years of life in ancient Egypt uh, to rule unless you were ruling as a little tiny child or something, was very unlikely. And I know I've looked many times at the pharaohs and their, and their time of rule. It's always been, you know, somewhat short. So, you know, that, that's, the, that's the reason the point, you know, it's, a lot of times people think, well, maybe the people in the olden days lived a long, long time. That's pre-Andalubian destruction, not post-Andalubian destruction. So, uh, so yeah, that, that is very fascinating indeed. Um, and as far then as the Exodus Pharaoh, um, which we basically have a timeline to go by now, especially seeing from the what you have discovered that in fact it was 430 years that they were there, uh, who would that Pharaoh be then for the Exodus that Moses had to deal with? And is it a possibility that it was his so-called stepbrother, as Cecil B. DeMille has portrayed to the world from the uh, biblical scholars of his day. I wouldn't necessarily say that we have any reason to believe historically that it would have been his stepbrother, but certainly um, the one king that fits uh, the, the sketch perfectly is Amenhotep II, and um, and his father, the Thutmose the Third who was, he's, no, he's known to history today by scholars, by Egyptologists, as the Napoleon of Egypt. And it's with good reason because he invaded all the way to the Euphrates River in his year 33 military campaign. But as well, he ruled into his 54th year. We know that from history. So that's over the 40 year period. And, and it's partly uh, because as a young child, he came onto the throne. And at that very time, because he was so young, um, uh, Hatshepsut came on to the throne as well, um, you know, first as his, uh, his, his protector, and then she became an official pharaoh, and she became a co-regent with him, and she disappears off of the scene um, right about the very time that, according to the biblical text, Moses uh, would have killed an Egyptian and fled to Midian. So certainly one possibility, and I talk about this in the article that I published in 2006 that you can download from my academia.edu webpage, it's very possible that Hatshepsut was the Egyptian princess that drew Moses out of the water and that at the, the very time that Moses killed an Egyptian and fled up at, out of you know, turmoil or out of shame or some other reason, Hatshepsut felt that she needed to leave the throne, and she just disappears off of the throne, and all of a sudden, the, the reign of Thutmose III just continues um, as it had been, and she's no longer the, the, the co-regent. So all of this, um, the, the Egyptological history involved here fits, fits extremely well with the history that we read about in the biblical text. And, oh, and it, if I can add as well, um, Amenhotep II, saying he took over for, for Egypt's most glorious, most powerful pharaoh. And, and I read a few superpowers that existed in the time. One was Mitanni, um, up in the, uh, the northern Levant and going all the way um, over to Mesopotamia. Um, and then Egypt was the other. And, um, and Thutmose III, the father of Amenhotep II, he uh, led... I think it was a total of 18 military campaigns into the Levant and, again, all the way to Mesopotamia, 
the farthest extent that Egypt had, had ever reached in its um, in its uh, imperial ambitions. And all of a sudden, coming into the reign of uh, Amenhotep II, you have, in his third year, you have a glorious, what's called a glorious military campaign where he's conquered his foes and he's jousted with the, the powerful superpower Mitanni. And his the final uh, uh, military campaign that that Amenhotep II led, that we know about in history, was in his year nine. And on, and on the Memphis stela, which records that military campaign, that second Asiatic military campaign, if it is, um, it has some fascinating information. And again, this is the final um, uh, military campaign that, that he led into Asia that we know about. And, and the $65,000 question is, if Egypt was at the height of its glory, and Thutmose III, the father, passed on the baton to his son, Amenhotep II, and he took that baton, and he boasted, and, and of course, um, the, the stele that we, that we uh, have from his reign uh, document how he boasted of all of his great deeds, how he could shoot a bow extremely well from standing on a, on a, on a chariot and so forth. If all of this um, happened, then why all of a sudden do we have no future military campaigns recorded? Why? When that's the very thing that Amenhotep II loved doing the most, he was taking military campaigns into Asia, continuing his father's uh, conquests. And if he's a super, if he represents the king, the pharaoh of one of the two superpowers, why did he not continue Egypt's military interests? But what we find in the Memphis Stella is that he conquered over, according to him, over 100,000 slaves out of a clear blue sky. You never, ever have this number mentioned before. And if you combine all of the military campaigns of his father that give us a total of the captives taken, plus the first campaign of Amenhotep II, and you add them up, you take that number, that added number, and you multiply it by 46, and that's the number we get for the number of slaves that Amenhotep II con conquered in his year nine military campaign. And among those 100,000 100, plus captives, you have 3,600 Apiru. And yes. at some point, eventually, I'm going to make an argument. Again, it's been made in the past, and now. Uh, 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 Apiru with the Hebrews. But I think the Apiru here are definitely the Hebrews. And this is the first mention that we have in Egypt's uh, annals of Apiru who had been captured. In the reign of Thutmose III, we have documentation in the uh, tomb, the wall paintings on the tombs at, um, at Thebes that mention Apiru, but they are vintners tending vines, just like in Sinai 376 that we read about, right? That's what the Apiru are doing. Now, all of a sudden, in the reign of Amenhotep II, in his year nine campaign, he's conquering, and, and this occurs in November of the same year after uh, what I call the, the year and the day of the um, of the Exodus, which is the 24th of April in 1446. In November of that same year, that's when he goes on this campaign. And of course, virtually no other ancient um, ruler would go on a military campaign in, in the um, winter months or in in the late fall and winter months, because that's not the season for uh, military campaigns. That's the season for, um, you know, building up what you already have within your your country and your nation. So here we have 3,600 Apiru who are captured by Amenhotep II in this in this glorified slave raid, and it's nothing more than that because he only goes into the southern half of the Levant and no further. Um, to where they had been conquering before. And he does nothing else but conquer slaves. Why do we have 3,600 Abiru? And why do we have no more future military campaigns led by Amenhotep II? And why does one of the two superpowers just stop becoming a superpower and stop exerting its might throughout the ancient world? Because he's in All the of bottom the of the sea. <laughs> That's the reason he's in the bottom of the sea now. And... Uh... Oh, wow. That's, you know, it's incredible the work that you've done, Dr. Petrovich. And uh, 
Uh, we definitely want to have you back on again uh, here on Israeli News Live to do a follow-up uh, after you get your second book out. And uh, how, let me ask you this in closing, um, how do people, how can they actually get your book itself? Uh, we can show that here on the screen as well, but how would people actually order the book? Sure, and, and I would say the most effective way would be to go to the website of my publisher, which is Carta. Carta is out of Jerusalem, and it's wonderful to have a, a publisher who's not only Israeli, but who is centered in Jerusalem itself. So I'm thrilled that Carta published my book. Um, and if you go to Carta's website, um, actually, in, if you go to the main page of the website, the first thing that will pop up is the opportunity to purchase the world's oldest alphabet, Hebrew as the language of the proto-consonantal script. And um, it's any day now, as I speak, that the publisher will have it ready, that Carter will be ready to ship out the book. But they're already taking um, uh, pre-orders, and, uh, and any day the book will show up at their doorstep and, and go out to all who have pre-ordered. Guys, thank you for watching. Uh, in the description below, we'll have the information that Dr. Petrovich has shared with us, including the link uh, to be able to purchase his book there. Uh, I encourage you to get that, and uh, uh, very much a blessing, and I'm looking forward to the second one, and I haven't got to read the first one yet either, so i got to get my own order in. So thank you, my brother. God bless you. Shalom, and, uh, and see you guys next time. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Eric.